let's say that we have a function that takes in a generic parameter. Inside this function, if you try to simply print this input, the code will not compile. The reason why this code does not compile is because this generic data type t must also implement the trait debug. In general, when you're working with generic data types and generic traits, you must further specify their constraints. For example, in the code above, we need to specify that this generic data type t must implement the debug trait, stdfmt debug. Compile the code again, and the code now compiles. This is a trait bound. We're specifying a bound on the generic data type t. Here it's saying that the generic data type t must implement the trait debug so that it can be printed out. In this video, I'll show you more complex use cases of trait bounds. Let's say that we have traits A, B, and C. The data type U32 will implement the traits A, B, and C. The data type I32 will only implement the trait A. Now let's say that we have a function C. It takes in a generic data type of type T. How do we say that this type T must also implement trait A? As we saw in the example above, all we have to do is say colon and then say A. Now this type T must also implement trait A. To show you this, let's create a data type of U32, I32, and then call the function C. U of type U32 is equal to 1. Say I of type I32, set it equal to minus 1. And then let's also have a float. F of type F32 equal to, say, 1.0. And then if we call the function C with U, this code will compile since the data type U32 implements the trait A. And likewise, we can also call this function C with I32. I32 implements A. However, if you try to pass F32 and then try to compile a contract, the code does not compile since F does not implement the trait A. We can also specify multiple traits. So for example, let's say that we have another function. Let's call this M. And we want to say that this generic data type T must implement A and also B. In this case, we do A plus B. This tells Rust that this generic data type T must implement A and B. In our example, we can call this function M with our data type U32, since U32 implements the trait both A and B. However, if we try to call the function M with I32, then this code will not compile since I only implements the trait A. However, the function M requires that I implement both A and B. It doesn't implement B. Hence, the code does not compile. We can also come up with a more complex use case. So, for example, we can say t implements a plus b, and let's say u must implement b and c. And for the inputs, let's say x is of the type t and y is of the type u. Then we will rename this function to w. If you wanted to make this code look a little bit cleaner, you can use the where syntax. Here, I'll type where, and then I'll take all of this code and then paste it here. And then inside here, we'll remove this and this trait bounds. So now the code does exactly the same thing. However, we made the code look a little bit cleaner by moving our trait bounds into the where clause. Okay, let's actually call this function, function w. The first input must implement a and b. The second input must implement b and c. In this example, the only data type that we can pass is a u32 since U32 is a data type that implements all the traits A, B, and C. Inside the main function, we can call W, U, and then pass in another parameter of the type U32. For this example, let's just pass in U, and the code compiles. However, we won't be able to pass another input, such as a I32. The code does not compile since I32 only implements the trait A. For the final part of this video, I'll explain the difference between using the syntax import trait and trait bounds for function inputs. Here's one way to write a function and specify that the inputs must implement trait A. And here's another way that we've seen in this video using trait bounds. There's a subtle difference between writing a function in this form using the keyword impul and the syntax using trait bounds. The difference is in the first function definition, the type of x and y can be different as long as they implement the trait A. However, in the second case, both the type x and y must be of the same type that implements trait a. So for example, for the function k, since we can pass in two different types of inputs, let's pass in u and i that both implement trait a. Save the file and the code compiles. However, for the function g, we said that we need to pass in the same types. For example, u and u will work. We can also pass in i and i. However, we won't be able to pass u and i or i and u. Different data types. 
Although both implement trait A, here we all need to pass in the same data type. Going back up, this is because in the first function definition, it says that the input X must implement trait A and the input Y must implement trait A. There's no constraint here that says both X and Y must be of the same type. However, in the second function definition, here we're saying that both X and Y must be of the type T and this type T must implement trait A. Here there's a constraint saying that both X and Y must be of the same type. Now if you wanted to create a function like this where both X and Y can be of different type that implements a trait A, but using trait bound syntax, here's how you do it. So let's copy this and then rename this to function H. All we have to do is declare another generic data type, let's say U, and we say that this U must implement A. And finally, we change this second input to type U. Now, this syntax says X must be of type T that implements trait A, and Y must be of type U that also implements trait A. It doesn't say that both X and Y must be of the same type. So now we can put in different data types. And to show you this, let's go back to this example. Instead of calling G, let's call H. Save the file and the code compiles. So those were some advanced use case of trait bounds.